guys. We have the and girls. We have the money here on stage. If you ever want to raise money, these are your investors. So please, let's start with an introductory round. Florian, why don't you get started? Yeah, hi. My name, my name is Florian um, from Project A Ventures. We are an early stage um, seed Series A fund here in Berlin. We've uh, been active since 2012, uh, just in the process of raising our third fund. First one was 80 million euros, now 140 million, and the next one will be 180 to 200 million. Yeah, and we invest into six to eight startups per year. Uh, initial ticket is one to four million euros. Um, that's basically us. Should I continue? Tim, continue. Does it work? Yeah. Hi, my name is Tim. Um, I'm with Early Bird. We are an early stage investor out of Europe. Currently, we have uh, three early stage funds in the market. Um, we are 45 people in total, 12 partners, and are basically split between a fund that sits in Istanbul and covers all of our Eastern European uh, focus area. We have a fund here in Berlin um, and in Munich um, that is a 175 million fund focusing mainly on Series A investments, and we have a dedicated medtech fund um, that purely invests in, in healthcare. Um, we have been around for uh, quite a while, so we were founded back in 1997, so we're doing venture capital now since 22 years. Um, a few of our companies you may know, so we were the first fund in N26, we're also the first fund in UiPath, um, and yeah, that's us. Yeah, I'm Robert. I'm the founder of uh, Visionaries Club. We're a new Berlin-based 80 million fund focusing on B2B technologies. And I'm running the fund together with Sebastian Pollock, who has founded Amorelli before. And what makes us a little different from other VC funds is that our investors, they're only successful entrepreneurs. Um, why? Because we think um, access to these entrepreneurs is the best support that we can actually provide to startup companies in the early stage. So we have 15 uh, digital entrepreneurs, like the founders of Flixbus, Get Your Guide, Auto One, Rantastic, Trivago, and many others who have really successfully founded digital companies. And then we have 15 family business entrepreneurs, like Swarovski, Fisman, Miele, who have interesting networks in the old economy that they can bring into B2B companies, which is something very interesting, uh, because you know in B2B, you don't uh, acquire your users via Facebook TV. You, you need to, to get a foot on the ground. And um, yeah, I mean, in the past, uh, before I started a fund called La Familia, which was a small seed fund where we did 30 investments and companies like Freytab, Koya, OnTrack, um, Azana Rebel. And yeah, looking forward to the, to the discussion. Yeah, hi. Olaf. My, my name is Olaf. I'm from Cabinamic Ventures. Um, we are a venture firm located in Cologne in Berlin. Uh, our current fund is a 115 million fund. We are predominantly investing in German-speaking countries mainly in deep tech and B2B tech. Um, our investors in our fund is 50% corporate investors, companies like Cisco um, from the Valley or um, a big insurance company, AXA. Uh, the other 50% are high net worth individuals, formerly entrepreneurs or still entrepreneurs. And um, the companies we've invested in, you might know, are companies in Berlin, for example, Adjust, um, or Staffbase in Chemnitz in New York. And um, before, I'm in venture capital since 2007 now, and before I've grown, um, raised, and founded uh, three startups. So I'm in this industry since 1999 now. Thank you for the introductory round. So thank you for the introductory round. So you can see um, these are the guys with the money. If you want to raise, you can talk to them afterwards, and you can ask your questions twice during the panel. In the middle of the panel, after 20 minutes, you have the opportunity to ask questions, and then again towards the end. So prepare, grill them, and um, now is the time to learn. Now, I want to learn from you guys, why don't we have bigger companies in Germany? I mean, we have more and more big companies, but it's, we are still far behind China, and we are still far behind the US. What needs to be done to improve that? Olaf, to make it started. Well, first of all, I think we're on the right path. Um, if we compare 1999, the first, you know, I would say entrepreneur renaissance, um, some, some, some people call it uh, the internet bubble, with today, just 20 years down the road, um, I think we, we see a lot of big companies. Uh, you already mentioned companies like um, Auto Eins, um, Number 26, 
uh, I named Adjust, uh, one of the world market leader in attribution business, really deep tech in, in, in the mobile marketing area. So I think we're on the right path. There's still, it's a, um, a long way to go, but compared with the US in, um, uh, um, industry, which, is a, which has a head start of 35 years, uh, compared with the German startup industry, uh, I think we are on the right path here. So Robert, you just started your fund. What do you do different to really, and how do you help the companies to grow big? To grow big? Um, yeah, I think um, the, the one thing that, that we can really provide to founders is we, we have this great network of 30 entrepreneurs who've taken companies from zero to sometimes more than a billion of revenues. And I think um, giving our startups access to, to those entrepreneurs who've gone through this path is something much more valuable than that, that, that we couldn't like provide on our own. I think it's, uh, it's, it's better to, to, to bring the, the founders in touch with them. And on the other hand, I think uh, maybe also following up on your question, I see a very big potential in Europe really in very strong B2B champions because the last 15 years we've seen a lot of consumer internet companies, which was great because there was rocket internet and there was business school students that were starting companies, but we are now seeing really engineering students starting companies and gaining momentum. You have Salonis in Munich, you have so really strong companies going there. And I think this is something where we can build big companies out of Germany because our DNA is all those industrial world market leaders. And um, I think with our B2B network of family businesses, I think this is something uh, where we can support those B2B companies getting product market fit, getting initial customers, which is something very difficult for B2B startups. And that's hopefully how we can uh, help form some more big companies in this space. Tim. You invested in N26, and it's a unicorn, and it's fast growing. Why are there not even more fast growing companies? What needs to be done? Like the question I asked uh, Olaf also. So can, can it be replicated more often? I mean, you yeah. have so many good portfolio companies, but not so many unicorns. So I think, I think it was uh, basically following up to question one. Um, I think the gap between European uh, companies that become very big to the US is becoming less and less. I think the statistics uh, within the last 15 years showed that there was a gap of at least 10x between unicorns in the US and in Europe. Right now, I think it's half. So we have a huge catch up. And what we see is that we can create much more value with less money here in Europe than we do in the US. Right? So obviously, we miss a lot of growth capital here in Europe. And the funds from the US come in here at Series B onwards and basically like to invest into our champions and then also bring them to the US. So, for example, what we have seen with UiPass, it's a U US company right now. Yeah, so they have scaled, so it's a B B2B company, they have scaled extremely fast. So, and once they basically show that they have a proven model, a US uh, investor came over and invested in, in, in them. And, this is, this is a scenario that we see quite often, but I think right now the trend and the patterns that we see out of Europe here are, are looking quite good. So to answer your question, I think right now we are just on the right track, right? So in terms of N26, these were very ambitious guys, right, that came to us and pitched, we want to build a 100 million customer retail bank, fully digital, and right now they are on the right track to do so. But you obviously need to have the right mindset in order to create such a company. And we sometimes maybe lack the European entrepreneurs that also think so big. But uh, in terms of the patterns that we see coming out of Europe, I think it looks, it looks quite promising right now. Florian, would you agree that you're on a good track? What, what, can, what should be done by the entrepreneurs and investors better? Um, I, I would. I would think that what also Robert said um, earlier and Olaf, I think B2B very likely is going to produce the next larger companies, significant companies coming out of Europe. Um, so the chances are pretty high that this will happen. And I think what can you do to improve this? I think where we still miss some opportunities is the tech transfer out of universities into companies. Yeah, I mean, there's great technical universities in Aachen, in Munich, uh, even in Berlin. Um, and I think if you, if you see the founding activities out of technical universities in Germany, there's something happening like Exist, etc. It's, 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 it's not bad, yeah? but I think if you look at the business angel scene around those universities and if you, if you see how much potential there would potentially be and how much companies actually realize, because as, as Robert said earlier, I think that 
business angel, uh, business uh, uh, school students found great companies. Yes, that can happen in the consumer space, but I think consumer space companies out of Europe, the tendency or the likelihood of them becoming really big is, is definitely lower than it is in the US, simply because of market characteristics. So it needs to be more tech, and I think that's where we need to accelerate. But I think you can accelerate it only to a certain point, because what you see is, is what the guy said earlier, big companies breed big companies. Yeah? So if you have people that come out of big companies that have seen something like Celonis or UiPath happening, they are the ones that are willing and able and also have the, 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 the thinking big enough to actually do something big. And I think that has been also a problem. There have not been enough examples in the past. And I think the more we see Zalando's and Delivery Heroes, etc., also in the technical area like UiPath and Celonis, etc., you'll see more and more companies there. But I think you cannot artificially accelerate it. And politics cannot do that much about it. It's simply a process that has to happen somehow, somewhat organically. So question to the audience, that's a good point. Question to the audience. Who of you, and please raise your hand if you're working in a big tech company, like Zalando, tech company. Adjust, <laughs> one, two, you have to start big companies now. You heard, Florian, you, you have to know, use the knowledge of scaling and start yep. your own company. Another question to the audience, who of you is running a company like an entrepreneur or wants to start a company? Very good. <laughs> you see, you have to scale faster. You have to learn, you have to um, get money in to, to grow big faster. Okay, now, yeah, yeah, just to add one, one, one thing, because I, I really like the discussion. If we go to the universities, if you take the business schools, you had an Oliver, Oliver Zamba that, you know, went to the students and told every one of you can start something like I did, and then you had this accelerating with the Zalando founders, and you had a momentum that, you know, if you look at universities like WHU, 50% of the graduates start a company. I studied in Aachen, and in 2008, none of my engineering uh, students wanted to start a company because there was no guest speaker telling a success story of an engineering co company that was founded. Because all those uh, family business entrepreneurs, they hide from the public, right? They don't want to, they kind of disappear because they made their money. I think it's important that we get a lot of engineering founders that have been successful to the universities, encouraging the next generation, telling their story, like in Munich, if you look at Salonis, if you look at Stylite, all those founders, they've really created a momentum in the ecosystem, and now you have ESA Aerospace, you know, like really rocket science, a company uh, spun out, you have Lilium Aviation, I think that's a great path now. Sorry. <laughs> it's good, it's good, let's have the interactive discussion. Yeah. Uh, now, the next question of me is, um, what do you think is the best German tech company and why? And you cannot name your investments. Well, uh, I, I've, I've seen this question. It's very tough. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're not able to name our investors. Uh, our investment. company. That so would be too easy. I, I've missed one. Uh, this is DeepL. Uh, I think all of you know DeepL. And uh, I didn't invest because I didn't understand it when they, uh, during the seed, seed round. So I missed this opportunity. Deep L. I, I'm using Deep L often because our UK guys in London, they of course obviously never speak German and I just put it in and send it over yeah. and say, Deep L translation, look at it, you can yeah. read it and understand it. Um, I mean, from a fascination point of view, of course, Lilium Aviation is, a, is an amazing company. I mean, they're reinventing mobility with an electronic airplane, um, which is kind of really sophisticated and uh, it's not just about the technology but it's really about the ecosystem how they think you know mobility could look like in 10 years I think a company that definitely fascinates me and it's great that we have such a risky company coming out of Germany good Tim we all we we also miss deep L um, <laughs> we also like that one a lot um, but um, one that I would have loved to invest with Mambu um, it's a company that you guys advise um, it's basically um, building a cloud-based core banking infrastructure here out of Berlin and um, there are a lot of banks using them and obviously or you might know that a lot of incumbent banks right now uh, run on very old technology and Mambu is just bringing in uh, very scalable tech in them and I found that a very interesting journey. I totally agree with you. Mambu is a great company. You advised them on a growth round mm -hmm. and Bessemer Venture Partners invested 30 million and it was super, super oversubscribed, and they had tons of term sheet from European and US investors. And what's also important, this is a company not founded by MBA um, um, students and not by business school students, but by software engineers. Yeah. And 
you may need more software engineers and technical engineers and um, hardware engineers to start startups. Florian. One company that I would have loved to invest in is Contentful, also a Berlin company, yeah. headless content management system. They really understood early that you know, no matter what the device will be, you will have to be somehow storing and having the content ready for mobile, for voice or whatever. And they do that and they do it in a very um, developer-friendly way. So a little bit like Stri Stripe is doing it in payment, they are doing it in content management. And yeah, it was pretty obvious in hindsight that this would have been a great company, but yeah, that's often the case. In hindsight, things are easy. Yeah. So Florian, in order to build bigger companies, what's your, uh, to build successful companies, let's say, what's your number one advice for founders? We have a lot of founders here in the audience, so each one of you, what's your number one advice? I think it depends whether you want to build a VC case company, then it will probably be a VC case company needs to be something that has a really big vision and has to make somehow, it has to have like unicorn potential because otherwise we cannot invest. But that's not right for everyone. And I think the, the first advice I would give everybody is you have to make yourself clear, is your aspiration really to build this VC type case company? Because that basically means that you have to have a really high risk curve and growth curve involved, and that's not right for everybody. And I think there's a lot of people seeking VC money that should not seek VC money because it's simply not right for them. And I think it's something you have to be really honest before you do anything, whether it's the right thing for your company to raise VC money, because that means to have, to have a really, really big vision, but also really high risk. And you might be a founder that's completely fine with running a great company that's bootstrapped, that's making money fast, but there will not be a VC case. And I think getting that clear in your head is probably the first thing you have to do because otherwise you will always have expectations missed or met or not met in any kind of uh, dimension. And I think that's not good. You'll not be a happy founder. and You should be, ideally. Yeah. Tim. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very good advice. Um, the one that I would give is if you, that you need to build something with passion. Um, so not because you clearly see that there is a market need, but you really need to want it, right? And you clearly need to do something because you just have the inspiration to do it. Because I think the most, most important thing that you need to know in advance is that a startup or working as an, as an entrepreneur takes a lot of time, right? And it will be a marathon that you need to run and there will be downturns and upturns, but um, basically you need to live throughout all these waves and therefore you need to create something you, you are very passionate about. Great points by Tim and Florian already, uh, since I have to name another one, I guess, <laughs> and can't just agree. I would uh, really try to um, choose your co-founder very carefully and really try to make sure that if you work together with a person, uh, never, never, never compromise on the person you start a company with. and. The same is true for the hires that, that you make at the beginning because um, the, the, you built a product that is not there yet and a market that is not there yet with a team that is not there yet. And if you have the wrong team members, it can be ugly very, very quickly. So I would really try to choose a complementary great co-founder where you also have a personal fit and uh, where you can you know, go through all ups and downs. Olaf. Well, <clears throat> first of all, don't listen to all these advices. <laughs> Even to, not to mine, um, because you will get tons of advices. Um, uh, one founder which I really admire and, um, and respect, and he's still the CEO of a company. I, I, I was lucky to do the seed investment um, seven and a half years ago. Now he has about 350 people and it's growing like hell. Um, after the seed investment, he said, okay, you won't see me in conferences or on conferences for the next three years because I will keep my head down and uh, work my fingers uh, to the bone. I think this is an advice, don't get distracted, especially if you're located in Berlin. Don't go to parties, don't go to conferences, uh, just keep working. And just go to a startup night and ex exhibit your startup yeah. <laughs> and win new customers here tonight. Now, it's time for the audience to ask questions. The first round of questions from the audience, we have microphones. Um, in the middle, or someone with a mic here's someone with a microphone, so please raise your hand. Any questions? Stand up, and the microphone will come to you. 
you won't learn if you don't ask. So here you have a question. Very good. First question. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for coming in and um, giving this uh, interesting panel discussion. Uh, my question is regarding the current situation in Germany in um, regards to the employer stock ownership up plans. Um, what's your take on that? Is there like um, much room to improve or compared to the US? And um, how, how do you advise um, yeah, regarding the ESOPs on your own startups? Very good question. Who wants to take it? I can take it. Um, so first of all, there's a big difference between um, Germany and, and our tax system. Um, so it was about ESOPs, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, the, um, the difference between the United States and, and, and Germany. Um, in Germany, we tried back in, back in 2000 uh, the normal stock option program, and it failed uh, because it was way too complicated. And um, from, from the taxation point of view, um, not really interesting. And so that's why we switched, I think the entire industry more or less, switched to virtual share options, um, which um, is more an exit participation right. Um, so you don't get um, voting rights with, uh, with the shares you can buy. Um, but um, the, the flip side of the medal is still the, um, the double taxation compared with the normal uh, ESOP program in the United States. Um, I think it's important um, to have a VSOP or ESOP program um, to keep um, you know, the core team together. And um, so I can highly recommend to, to every founder to, to set up a, um, a VSOP program or ESOP uh, program due to the fact you normally haven't done it before. Um, talk to your investor, talk to friends, other, other CEOs, how to do it. There are various options. So next question. Any more questions? Yes, here's a question, and the microphone is coming. Hello, Norbert Wale from Air2E. Um, you mentioned many startups that are more in the tech scheme. You focus even on deep tech and so on. But Robert mentioned also Lilium, for example, which is more hardware driven. And we don't see that that much on the market yet. Is that something for the future that is more interesting, even hard investing as a VC in hardware driven uh, companies? What? I mean, uh, happy to take. Uh, it, 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 it's a great question. Um, I think the convenient thing, of course, for a VC is if you look at digital technologies, there are less capital, um, they need less capital and um, normally they have a faster time to market so the, the risk is a little less and that's why VCs love digital technologies, they are very efficient and address big markets like Salonis and some companies we've discussed. I think the other thing about hardware, if you look in the US it's different because you have bigger funds. So if you look at the average European US VC fund that is like in the really focused top tier market, it's a billion plus and you have even Sequoia Growth with 8 billion, and then you have SoftBank, and uh, even Bessemer Founders Fund, they are all 1 billion plus. The biggest European fund is Atomico, it's 800 million, and they back Lilium, because if you back a hardware company that has such a risk profile that needs 100 million plus to, to build it, you need a big fund to, to really take the companies through the next financing rounds, and if you're only a 150 million fund, and you invest 10 million in Lilium, and they need another 50 and another... Uh, I think that that's the one reason why it has been slower in Europe. I think the good news is that um, the international growth funds, they are looking more and more into Europe because um, you know, the deal flow in the US isn't as crazy anymore as it has been in the last 15 years and the funds have raised record amounts so they need to deploy their capital and the good thing is I think this encourages more uh, tech companies in Europe that can be also funded through growth stages. If you look at Lilium, Tencent did the growth round so they, they put in I think 80 million or 70 million quite early after Series A and yeah. Anyone else wants to add to that? I think, yeah, I, I think theoretically it would be a good idea yeah. if you would have the fund structures. <laughs> yeah, so it can be, and, and also the competence on the VC side. I think if you look at the current competence profile of VCs in Europe, there are not very many hardware VCs and I think it's a completely different competence and skill set you would need. And I think it doesn't help if people that don't have a clue of this start investing in it. I mean, it's fun, yeah? But I think you need a kind of organic development of a, of a VC scene in, in this area. And I currently don't see that many people who would be able to do this. Yeah. Yeah. There was a big hardware exit recently. But not saying that recently. it's a bad opportunity. It would be a good opportunity. 
There was a big hardware exit recently and the investors, as I read, were more, more publishing groups and hardware producers and toy companies, Tony Box, uh, this connected speaker for kids you oh. put in on um, um, like an animal and it plays like a, a music uh, or a story about animals. So you put in another character and then it plays um, a fairy tale. And this box, was, this company was uh, sold uh, at an enterprise value of 300 million to a private equity investor, Düsseldorf-based startup. So neither in one of the tech uh, area uh, cities, nor uh, funded by tech yeah. investors, but by toy companies and publishing groups. Mm -hmm. More questions from the audience. Yes, we have a good flow. We have two questions actually. The first, this one, and then uh, to the left. Yeah, um, hello. At first, let me thank you um, for coming here. And my question is actually about the timing of Series A funding. Because uh, we are looking at seed funding right now, and we already heard focus is really important. So my question is when we have the funding to go get a POC working, when should we go looking for a Series A funder? Should I take it? So we, we just talked about it before we came on stage. So typically you would say that you need to have, let's say, a certain commercial, commercial proof that your model works, yeah? So that there is, let's say, some recurringness in your revenues and this is not one-time fees uh, that you generate over those POCs. This is how, let's say, VCs would typically look at a Series A. So if there is, let's say, some certain product market fit, that you can basically validate over some commercial traction being, for example, recurring revenues. Um, those days, however, look a bit different. Yeah? So the private VC market has also here a lot of liquidity and the good founders or the founders that are also known to the investors, and we, we talked about this, um, they can raise a Series A, um, also just with POCs being up and running. So, Right now, seed rounds are much higher and there's much more uh, liquidity here in the ecosystem and you don't really need to show that in order to raise a big Series A, but if you have that proof, you can easily raise a 10 million Series A these days. So to answer your questions, typically uh, get some market validation, get some commercial validation, show that your model works and then raise a proper Series A. Yeah, I'd like to add something to this. Um, so everybody's talking about Series C, Series A, B, but uh, these thresholds are not black and white. Um, these are you know, gray areas. And as, an, as a CEO, I, I would, they're saying after the fundraise is before the fundraise. So you're in constant fundraise mode. So if you keep contact with interested investors, and for you, interesting investors, um, maybe you will raise the next round um, even before you would have would have thought about it. So I don't want I don't I don't want to go out and say, well, in next month I will start the fundraise for Series A because I reached 100k MRR. You, you read this on TechCrunch and a lot of blogs. I think it's 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 wrong. Um, some some markets and some. Some businesses are so interesting that maybe some investors would jump on you um, with 50k MRR, and you don't know this. Just talk to these investors constantly, keep them informed, and um, and maybe you raise half year earlier the Series A. There was one question on the left side, exactly. Uh, so I think microphone. I'm the next. I already got the microphone. I'm okay, um, yes. Victoria ladies from Dunn, and, and I have a question answer. regarding your requirements for investment, let's say Series A. The what? Um, so the I know that there are requirements regarding product market fit, commercial fit, um, let's say order inflow, whatever, but you ever considered as well looking more in a due diligence regarding broader HR or culture or people, so not only due diligence for product or commercial fit somehow. Yeah, yeah. I, should I? So, what you just mentioned are the most important thing for any VC. Yeah. So, 
typically you always invest in people, not in any proof or something that you need to DD in order to figure out if that's an investment or not. So within all rounds, doesn't matter if it's seed, series A, whatever, you just, I mean, to a very major extent, invest in the people. Of course, primarily into the founders because these are basically the people that you are giving your money into. Um, but if you are, let's say, going into a company and see how they work, try to get a feeling how they hire. So it's the culture that comes along. So to answer your question, so the people thing behind an investment is by far the most important component behind any investment that we do. Probably to add to that, um, I think the earlier you raise, the more important is the people. And, and I'm sometimes surprised what people are achieving, which kind of performance. I would have never guessed. Yeah? So I think the later you are and the more traction you see, it's not that the people become less relevant, but I think you're more open and more flexible in how people are actually achieving the performance that you see. Yeah? And then you're sometimes, I'm sometimes amazed what kind of constellations of people achieve which performance and vice versa. So I think if you want to raise a Series A right now, today, I mean, the average Series A in Berlin is probably three to seven or eight million, sometimes 10. Yeah, I mean, that means if you want to dilute only 20, 25%, which is a normal dilution, that means you need to have an enterprise value of like 10 to minimum, like 30 million valuation. And for that, I think at least, it definitely makes sense to have a certain level of commercial traction because if you're raising money, as Olaf said, your next fundraise will be minimum or ma maximum 12 to, to 18 months away. So I think in, this, in order to, to be able to, to raise a proper round um, in, in this due time frame, you need to concentrate at least to a certain level uh, also on the commercial traction, the commercial proof, um, because if you want to raise a Series B or C, I think fundamentals and the structural economics of the business become more and more important. Yeah. So there was one more question on the left here. Okay. Th thanks for the talk. Uh, I have actually two quick questions. Uh, first one may be a natural continuation of the last one. So what is the main characteristic for the founder slash team that you will never invest in? I'd like to hear from, from all of you. Uh, and the sec second one is that uh, what is the uh, balance, proportion of uh, gut feeling versus facts when you are deciding whether to invest or not to invest? Thanks. So uh, I take the first unfair question. Um, so the question was uh, in what kind of team constellation we would never invest? Um, it's tough to answer, but I think there's one characteristic. Uh, I wouldn't invest in a couple. <laughs> because um, a partnership of entrepreneurs, of founders, um, statistically, mi statistically might last longer than uh, a relationship. Um, so if you build a company, take 10 years, and I think statistically a relationship won't last, especially in the mid-20s, not as long as um, um, the partnership of founders. So you can run into, into troubles as an investor. And I think adding to that point, I think 100% right, we've invested in a, in a couple, <laughs> and it was not a good idea. Um, but I think you can also, even between people that are not in a relationship, if you sense, and you can see that it's actually quite funny, if you sense potential for conflict yeah. in a partnership, and that is often the case if you have, you have to have, if there's one alpha person in the team there often cannot be another clear alpha person in the team because that's source for trouble. Yeah? So what I try to spot, which is not that easy, obviously, is whether you sense a certain type of conflict potential because it's such an intense relationship if they have to build a company for three, four, five, six years. It's not always easy. So if, people, if you already sense a certain energy between people, you know, because that's the biggest source of risk for failure. If, if a team doesn't get along on an emotional kind of side, it becomes a dysfunctional team right away. They can be the greatest, smartest, most complementary people ever. If emotionally it doesn't work between the team, the team is underperforming anyway. So I think that's for me, the, the, you try to sense that. And there's certain indicators, I would say, where that's pretty clear. And that is like a team hygiene is something I would really look for also as a 
as so Robert, a founding team. Robert and Tim, now you have to uh, take the other question. Gut feeling or rational decision? I think, um, maybe to quickly start with, um, I think gut feeling is interpreted in a wrong way. If you look at people and you have you listen to your gut feeling about, you know, whether someone is someone you want to back or not. I think gut feeling is the accumulated experience you have through all your life, but which you maybe at that moment can't tell why, right? Because it's like all the things that you've learned in your life together, and that, that results in the gut feeling whether something is positive or not. So I think um, with, with people it's important to, uh, to, to listen to the gut feeling. But I also wanted to quickly add to what Florian said, because it's something very important. When, when I look at, at founders, I think it's very positive if founders can take the ego out of the equation. Because, um, you know, if someone has a really, really strong ego, there's a lot of potential for conflict. If, if you look at many successful unicorns we discussed about, like Flixbus or the one, the founder teams are they're super smart, they're extremely successful, but they remain very, very humble, even though they've been very successful and they took the ego out of the equation, which is always a great starting point for the best teamwork with the co-founders, with the VCs. And if you put it the other way around, if you have a super strong ego, it can be like a Steve Jobs thing, but there are not that many Steve Jobs on earth that really have a super ego and form this amazing company. Yeah. Thanks. Tim? Nothing much to add, to be honest. I think the um, founder clicking is something very, very important. And we even spend one day together with the founders sitting there, see how they are and see how they click, how, how they basically split their work. So. It's, uh, I think, one very, very component. Otherwise, I, I very much agree with all being said. Good. So I come up with the next question. Um, what, is, or what was the funniest or most awkward moment you saw or experienced in a pitch um, when founders pitched to you? Florian, you want to be first? It was actually, it was really, uh, a founder was doing a demo. And one of us noticed that he was actually had been searching in his browser, like uh, had a browser extension of Firefox or whatever, and he was searching for a certain term, which basically said weight of sperm. Yeah? He was searching for this, and everybody was seeing it and like, well, in the room. It's like, and everybody was thinking, why in hell would somebody actually want to find out what the weight of sperm is? I mean, first of all, it's embarrassing, but then you also start to think, hmm. Why is that an important question? And who would ask that in which kind of situation? But it was actually funny because the guy never really found out that we all had read this. Did you invest in the company? No, <laughs> <laughs> no but it, that, not for that reason. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever they want to do in their private life, they can look for weight of sperm. That's all fine. No, I didn't like the company anyway, but I thought it was quite funny. that you know. So always check yeah, before you enter a room what kind of browser is still open. U porn or whatever, you should probably close it. Yeah? Um, and that was, uh, that was actually quite funny. Great. Yeah. Tim? I was thinking about that question. So we, we haven't seen so many weird uh, scenarios in a pitch, which is always typically very formal and people prepare when they come. And it's been basically weeks of uh, organization and preparations with the team. So but we have seen one case where the founders came. And with us, there are at least four partners sitting and the whole team so we're in a in a room i would say around 15 people so quite a packed room plus the founders and um they actually started their pitch and they put it uh, on the screen and then the founder was saying well we just wanted to be, to be very transparent we just signed an exclusive term sheet and we were like you just signed an ter exclusive term sheet yeah so we will go with the other vc and then everyone was like okay then are we done and then I said, yeah, we are done. So, and then they stood up again and went outside the room, which was a one a bit <laughs> like weird scenario there. But that was, I think, the only weird case that I saw. Did they close with this investor? Do you yes, know? they did. OK. Yeah. So at least it worked for them. It, was a it didn't okay work for you, deal. but yeah. Robert. Nice. Oh, well, um, let me think. I think, you know, in times of video conferencing and where you all sometimes really have pitches also via video. I had a situation where we had a video call with the team that was pitching and then sharing the screen and um, they went through the whole pitch and then we went into the you know, Q&A discussion and I was with a female colleague and then we just saw the whole time that the one guy was always using the snapping tool to do screenshots of the girl I was sitting in the room with, right? <laughs> and like after a while we were like, 
who is doing the screenshots all the time. And I think you didn't notice that he had still his screen on share. So um, <laughs> it was a little creepy, creepy situation. And there, there was, he was just saying, oh, I'm playing with the snipping tool, which, like, <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. so. Did you invest? No. no. <laughs> it was a good team. Like, sometimes it doesn't correlate. Creepiness to a good founder, it doesn't <laughs> exclude each other. What up? <laughs> Well, um, years ago, um, we had a, our meeting room was a glass cube, more, more or less, uh, like, like a greenhouse. And um, we had a management pitch um, scheduled. Management pitch means this is the meeting. This is the mother of all meetings for founders. So all the partners, all the, the entire investment team is there. Two founders, um, well, we were waiting for, for two founders. I was working on this deal for some weeks and um, convinced my partners um, to to invite them for a management pitch. And uh, so the doorbell, uh, doorbell rang and only one guy showed up and said, okay. So I asked all my colleagues to the meeting room and there was only one founder and said, so what's with your co-founder? Yeah, I, he doesn't feel well. Um, we had a company dinner yesterday and uh, maybe he has eaten something wrong and uh, so he, he won't make it. He said, okay, I'll start your presentation. Uh, everybody was listening, so market, product, customers, pipeline, and all of a sudden I saw that um, our assistant is going to the, uh, was going to the door and there was another guy coming in, in a suit, um, and um, she was guiding this guy to the meeting room. So this was the second founder. Uh, so he showed up and we said, hey, great, uh, you, you're feeling better? Um, yeah, I feel better. And so the other guy got nervous. And so... Um, the, in the room, we, we recognized the smell um, of alcohol. Um, and this guy was totally nuts. He was drunk, <laughs> totally drunk. So it was, wasn't a, uh, uh, it was a company outside uh, or offside. It was, a, you know, they, had, they, they got drunk yesterday or uh, the day before. And uh, he, he didn't make it. And uh, his co-founder made up a story that um, he had uh, some, you know, food poison. And um, after a while, he, he, he talked to this guy and said, can you please just leave the room? Um, so it was very human and uh, we didn't invest. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you don't but not, invest. But not because of this, uh, it was, the case was not so good. But, but, but if it would have been a great case, would you still have invested, knowing yeah. that one guy yeah. is super drunk did, yeah. coming yeah. to the pitch? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> you are an investor that really um, is flexible, I would say. Hopefully. And you know <laughs> that people also make mistakes. Yeah. So, thank you very much for the great panel. Time is up. You can talk to the investors afterwards, and I think we shared lots of experiences and stories. Thank you very much for coming. It was thank a great you. panel.